former Guardian newspaper managing director, and he will be giving us the opening prayer. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let's stand on our feet. Let us pray. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you for today. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for the life of your son, Tommy. And thank you for the privilege of coming in here again at the auspices of the CVR to look into matters that are important at this time to us. Lord, we commit everything into your hands. And we pray that you will steer us through morning's events in Jesus' name. We ask that out of this interaction, we come ideas, ideas that will build lives, ideas that will build our nation, indeed, in Jesus' name. We pray that you will help everyone who will be participating in one form or the other. But the very best is all that the people who are here in this room are looking up to you for. And you will do it this morning in Jesus' name. We want to thank you again for this is a privilege. And we ask for your blessings upon it. That at the end of today, where well, we know that it's been profitable and worthwhile spending time here in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, because we know you have answered. We pray in Jesus' name. Please remain standing as we take the national anthem. I'll call TK up to the podium. Please remain standing as we take the national anthem. ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. So as we get things started, there are a few very special guests we would like to recommend this, uh, to recognize this morning. And I would start with our chief host, uh, Professor Pat Utomi. Please, a round of applause for him this morning. Professor Utomi, please stand up. Also, recognition goes to um, General Yakubu Gowan, former Nigerian head of state who is with us and will be sharing a few thoughts with us this morning. Please a round of applause for him. We also have representing the president of Liberia, Honorable Eugene Nagbe. Please a round of applause for him as well. The chairperson of the board of directors for CVL, Professor Mrs. Ifoma Utomi. Please a round of applause for her. 
We also have with us Mr. Fred Agwehigwe. Please, a round of applause for him as well. With us, another special guest, engineer Ladi Olajide. A round of applause. Our special panelists will also be sharing their thoughts. We need to also, um, of course, recognize them and thank them for giving their time today. A number of panelists, but I will be sharing more about them later on in the course of the program. Uh, we also have with us, representing the FRSC sector commander, uh, the unit commander for FRSC Lagos Island, assistant corps commander, Hawati Oluwokere. Please, a round of applause for her. And while we may have recognized these special individuals, each and every one of you who is present in the hall today is very special to us, and we do appreciate the time that you have taken out to be part of the 16th CVL Annual Lecture. So please, a round of applause for yourselves. <laughs> set up in March 2004, the Center for Values and Leadership was set up to equip generations of young people with values and leadership skills in order to improve and change our society. At the core of the CVL are the values of professionalism, excellence, service, knowledge, honesty, integrity, and teamwork. The CVL has lived up to its goal with programs and initiatives that transmit values and develop leaders. Some of these programs include the CVL Role Model Forum, the CVL Leader Without a Title or Leader Without Title, the CVL Young Entrepreneurship Training Program, the CVL Widows Support Center, and the Annual Lecture and Symposium, which is on now. These programs and initiatives have been a continuous investment in creating an environment for the enhancement of lives of young people in Nigeria and beyond. So please, a round of applause for the Center for Values in Leadership. So ladies and gentlemen, as we continue to move on, I'd like to call to the stage at this point the chairperson of the CVL Board of Directors, Professor Ifoma Utomi. Please a round of applause for her. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I will stand on all the existing protocols. It is indeed a great honor and privilege for me on behalf of the board, the management, and staff of the Center for Values in Leadership to welcome you to this great occasion. For the past 16 years, the Center for Values in Leadership, CVL, has focused on leadership development and transforming values in the African society. And in this regard, we are here today, and with the great audience and panelists we have today, I believe that the discourse today will indeed be tremendous and will be no different. We have, in remaining consistent, and true to our goals, focused and fixed the theme for the next year's annual lecture symposium and the chairman of that occasion will be Professor Benedict O.K. Orama, who is the chairman of the African president of the Afri Exim Bank. And the title for that lecture will be Free Trade, Investment, Entrepreneurship, and Economic Integration for a New Africa. I believe that that will help us move from the area of political will to the area of performance that will affect the human condition. Now, 
This is not a vote of thanks, but I cannot miss this opportunity to thank a few people here, starting with our esteemed and one of our very favorite leaders in the person of the former head of state of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, General Yakubu Gowan. I would also like to thank the president of Liberia, who was going to be here, but last minute has to, had to send a representative in the person of the Minister for, of Information, Cultural Affairs and Tourism, Honorable Eugene Nabwe. Of course, our very own indomitable, indefatigable Archbishop of Sokoto in the person of Reverend Matthew, Bishop Matthew Hassan Puka. <laughs> and of course, I cannot forget all our stakeholders, all of you here present, all those in the public and private arena who have supported this process through the years. We are really grateful to you all. And I thank you for being here. And lastly, I cannot forget the reason for this day, this event being fixed on this day, and that is for the convener, the host of this event. Today is his birthday, my wonderful husband, Professor Pat Utomi. And so on this note, I just want to say thank you and once again wish you welcome and a good time. Thank you very much. So throughout the events of today, we will be asking ourselves a very critical question. Today we ask, is democracy making life better in Africa? There have been many conversations around how we have imported, in quotation, democracy and taken it upon ourselves. Are the lives of Nigerians and other Africans better for this style and form of government? And I'm very sure that the panelists, as well as the speakers, will adequately answer these questions and possibly raise even more. Because at a point in time in 2019, when Nigerians will go to the polls in just a few days, many are still wondering if democracy is taking us to a promised land. To continue to move things forward, I would like to invite to the podium one more time the host of this um, annual lecture and symposium, as well as the birthday gentleman. And I think this is our opportunity to stand on our feet and give him a rousing welcome. Please, ladies and gentlemen, for his welcome address, Professor Pat Utomi. I believe we can do better than that. Let's be seated. Your Excellencies, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I can't be uh, more happy than I feel this morning uh, with the fact that we have such an eminent group of uh, speakers, panelists, and chair, uh, because really, truly, uh, we're dealing with uh, a subject of such incredible importance that I think that uh, we should really have the entire country in this town hall meeting. I um, first began to seriously about my 
mind to why government exists fairly early in life. But the very first subject I re registered at the University of Nigeria in 1973, even as a freshman, was a 300 level course, the history of political thought. And from back then, it has been very, very clear to me that there is consensus on at least the philosophical view about why government exists. In a sense, government doesn't exist. The Leviathan, to ensure a number of things that as a collective, we need to have run properly. Life and property being secure typically tops that list. Uh, but people go on to look at the common good, the things that constitute good. But they may differ on how that common good is advanced. And this difference on how the common good is advanced creates tribes, different tribes, not in terms of the language they are born to speak, but tribes in terms of a community of values and beliefs. Um, I like very much to speak these days to the thoughts of a Harvard professor called Joshua Green, who has written a really interesting book as titled Moral Tribes. And the challenge for us today in Nigeria is what can But across the continent in Africa, there is the bigger question of whether politics, democracy, is making life better. We're going to engage this subject today, and I will not speak to it at this point, but I just want to say how grateful I am that there is this privilege of being able to engage with this subject matter. Um, during the course of today's meeting, we'll be introducing no launching fanfare, uh, but we'll be introducing a new book a book that I have written that deals with the same subject matter. The book is titled, Why Not? As somebody probably get five minutes to say a thing or two in review of that book at some point. It's not formally in the program. Uh, but Why Not comes from a personal engagement. From age 17, I have been deeply engaged. When General Gowan was head of state, uh, unfortunately, there was an incident at the University of Ibadan in which a young student called Kunle Adikweju was killed and was shot by the police. <laughs> One of the first things I did as a young undergraduate is become involved in a movement to protest police brutality. In fact, the story is much told about how my 18th birthday was marked in protests. As we were protesting, somebody was making a speech it was about 8 p.m. in the night, because this was at the University of Nigeria, where people were sort of not quite interested in what was happening in all the other universities in Nigeria, because they wanted to catch up with the school they had lost during the war. And so they didn't pay attention, so a group of us took it on ourselves to protest and make some trouble. And that person said, today, the 6th of February, 1974, will be remembered as the day there were people who were formally, physically demobilized after this civil war were finally mobilized. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, it's my birthday. I didn't actually remember my birthday. Now this kind of engagement in public life uh, since then has constantly thrown up worry. Why life this book begins to engage that subject. It has a staring subtitle, State Capture, Creeping Fascism, and Criminal Hijack of Politics in Nigeria. But I will leave you to judge when you read. But it is important for us to engage these subjects.
I thank you for coming. All right, so I think we can do one more round of applause for Professor Utomi this morning. We move on, just want to do a few more recognitions. Um, one more time, please, a round of applause for Bishop Hassan Matthew Kuka of the Catholic um, Archdiocese of Sokoto. Thank you very much, sir. With us, we also have Professor Bola Akiteriwe. He's also with us here. Please, a round of applause for him. We'd also like to recognize at this time, Dr. Ibilola Amal. Please, a round of applause for her. And now to a point in time, one I'm personally looking forward to in terms of hearing um, from this gentleman, a former Nigerian head of state, one of our very well-known, appreciated and recognized elder statesmen. But before he comes to the stage, just a quick background. Um, General Yakubu Gwan was born October 19, 1934 in Plateau State and joined the Nigerian army in 1954, becoming a second lieutenant on his 21st birthday in 1995. Now, after doing many... <laughs> my apologies. As I said it, my mind was calculating that, okay, but on his 21st birthday, my apologies. He attended the Royal Military Academy in Sandhurst in the United Kingdom and as well as the Staff College in Cambridge in the UK and the Joint Staff College Latimer. Um, on August 1st, he also, 1966, he became the uh, military head of states for Nigeria. He acquired a politics operating as an official observer at the Ghanaian presidential elections in 2008. There's much more that many of us know about um, General Gowan that is not here. And I know many people are looking forward to hearing his thoughts on, on today's theme. Is democracy really making life better in Africa? So please, ladies and gentlemen, to observe all protocol, I would ask that we stand on our feet as we welcome General Yakubu Gowan, who is the chairman of today's event, for his speech. Thank you very much indeed. Well, now you can hear me because I can hear, I can hear you too. Your Excellency, George Ware, President of Liberia, ably represented by Mr. Eugene Len Nagbe, Minister of Information and Culture and Tourism of Liberia. Your Excellencies, my Lord, uh, Bishop Matthews Kuka, my Lord, temporal and spiritual here present, 
our chief host, Professor Pat Utomi, and I think I must say I'm the chairman of CVL, uh, Mrs. Ifoma Utomi. Eminent panelists and discussants, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, may I say all protocols duly observed and append the appropriate protocol uh, to your person. May I, as chairman, sincerely welcome you all to this 16th Center for Value in Leadership Annual Lecture and International Leadership Symposium holding here at the Shell Hall, uh, Shell Hall Muson Center, Lagos. And I would like to say a big thank you to our chief host, Professor Pat Utomi, for inviting me to chair at the symposium and every one of you here uh, to individually participate in specific role. Thank you, Professor Utomi, and well done to the CVL uh, leadership. Thank you, Chairman of uh, CVL. I consider it expedient to specially commend the patriotic spirit of the leadership of the Center for Values in Leadership for organizing this symposium at such an auspicious time in Nigeria. The topic, it goes without saying, is especially appropriate for reasons that will become a lot clearer to us, uh, to us all, by the time this event winds down. In 10 days, Nigeria will go to the polls to exercise their franchise to elect a new president to lead the nation for the next four years. This will make the fifth successive cycle in 20 years that citizens of our nation would have, uh, would have unfettered say in deciding who leads them, uh, who leads them. This has, uh, this has not always been so in the history of our soon uh, to be 59 years of nation, of nationhood. Given our record of military interregnum uh, since independence in October 1960. But it is a commendable measure of the depth of our growth and development as a nation. Indeed, it is a graphic illustration of my, pre, uh, you know, of my personal answer of yes to the question of the day. Is democracy making life better in Africa? Is democracy making life better in Africa? As I said earlier, my answer to this question is a distinct and resounding yes. I look, I look around and see that a good number of participants at this symposium have lived the history of Nigeria's, Nigeria either on account of age or by learning and might be uh, tempted to conclude that my answer is a contradiction uh, in terms. Why? Because 
uh, was a general in the armed forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, which had a record of interventions in governance. Because I accidentally became head of state by virtue of the powers considered to issue forth from the barrel of the gun, which is very undemocratic. <laughs> and because no general election was held uh, during my, uh, my time, nine years in a, ter uh, a nine year term, uh, that is two terms, uh, the, you know, two terms. <laughs> Plus, plus one year of grace, <laughs> you know, as military head of state. And this was done because for overstaying my, my, you know, my time, and not because I did not want, uh, you know, to ensure democracy was returned, but because, uh, as the press put it at that time, uh, because I renege, I renege the promise that I made to return government, uh, to civilian government in 1976. I uh, have to continue, and you probably want to know the reason why. When I saw what the politicians, just before we gave them the go ahead to start, when they started really haranguing themselves and uh, doing things that was reminiscent to the period just before, uh, the, you know, the January 19, um, uh, January 1966 coup. You know, I was honestly so afraid to see the same uh, situation, like the Operation Wete, the problem in, uh, uh, the, you know, in the Middle Belt, etc. And I thought that this is certainly dangerous you know, to allow that to happen again and for it to encourage another, uh, you know, uh, you know, another return of the military. So I decided to say, I think we better concentrate on the development, economic development of the country. And then when well, we can then really ensure you know, to civilian rule. Well, uh, this is just an aside so that you know why that was done. <laughs> well, to take this position is the important point that governance by the military is not necessarily anti-democracy. Whilst I was on board, just to tell you a story, well, while I was on board a ship, uh, the MV Oreo, those of you who are old enough and uh, used to travel uh, to the UK by sea would remember uh, you know, the name of that, uh, the w one of the vessels at that time. You have the Accra, and you have the Oreo, and you have the Apapa, isn't it? So there you are. Whilst I was on board a ship, MV Oreo, headed for Nigeria from Liverpool, UK, in, uh, in, on the 31st of December, 1965. I think before many of you here were born. <laughs> uh, 1965. Uh, during that uh, period, when a lot of the passengers from across, well, across the world, from UK, from uh, the, the, you know, from all the countries in uh, West Africa, Gambia, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, the, you know, Ghana and Nigeria, when they knew that I was a military officer, uh, they were asking a question. They were asking me a question. Uh, do you think that a coup can take place in Nigeria? What a really Surprising, why are people asking me that question? I've just finished a course, and I'm just returning home. But of course, at that time, it is the usual thing. You have coups uh, in Central American uh, na nation, 
and then of course schools in uh, uh, the, you know in, uh, in in African countries. You have schools in uh, uh, you know the Middle East and also you know Asia. So that was the pattern. But why are people asking me this question, as though I was the one, <laughs> you know, I, I, although I was trying to to plan a coup, and I was very surprised. And of course, I denied emphatically that this is not so. I said, no, we are an apolitical army. Uh, we are an apolitical army, and uh, we are loyal to the government. We are loyal to the government of the day, and we are supposed to protect uh, the nation and to protect the democracy. And so such a thing can never happen. But interestingly enough, by the time we got to Accra, there were three coups in Central and West Africa. And one of them was very close to Nigeria. I don't know whether it was Togo or Dahomey, uh, Dahomey then. You know, and uh, my, so when I was asked that question again, do you think that a coup can take place in Nigeria? What I said then, what I said then, and honestly said then, well, now let me be a philosopher. If such a thing happens in Nigeria, that there is nothing impossible uh, in the world, but if such a thing happens in Nigeria, I hope the few loyal ones of us, that is of the military, officers and men, will deal with the situation and return the status quo. Now, what is that status quo? Well, I leave you to, uh, to think wh what it is. <laughs> that is to return uh, you know, democracy, etc. Unfortunately, it did not happen that way because 36 hours after, uh, after that, when we arrived in Nigeria, after my arrival in Nigeria, there was a coup. And of course, the story is that, yes, I was one of those officers and men that made sure that that coup did not succeed in Lagos and in Nigeria, and ultimately in Nigeria you know, as a whole. So at least you can see that I've been a believer in, demo, uh, in democracy. And you know, right from the beginning and right through. And of course, you will ask the question, then how did you become a military head of state? Because you said you are going to return the status quo. <laughs> now, the reason was that, yes, what happened and the events that happened after that really created a situation whereby I found myself there was no way I can get away with it but to accept responsibility to lead the nation so that at least uh, one hope we can be able to, once things are brought back to normal and in order, we can be able to uh, restore democracy as soon as possible. And of course, one promise at the appropriate time that this was going to be done until I reneged but for a good reason, for a good reason. So what went wrong? Answers to that question are outside the immediate scope of today's event. But suffice it to say that in 20 years, Nigerians alike have continued to act in ways that make passions into politics both un and unattractive regardless of the challenges of our democracy. By extension, it can safely be said that by our collective resolve to continue to vote 
and ensure that our votes count. We all uh, agreed that there are inherent benefits in entrenching, uh, in entrenching democracy. The Nigerian example again, by extension, has continued to spread across Africa, thus solidifying the tenets of democracy. One sure thing, uh, though, is that democracy cannot be strengthened in the absence of enduring structures like the judiciary, the legislative, the public service, among others. But the strongest I consider being the public, uh, being, uh, being the public service. And all those institutions, of course, are public service. I speak from experience because back in the late 60s and uh, mid 70s, my government benefited immediately from the experience of the rich pool of our public servants, civil servants, who were very well trained by the colonial administration and the government of the First Republic. A good civil service is one that is totally committed to the government of the day regardless of the political party in power or their political belief. In this regard, the military also falls within the ambit of good public service. Civil servants, by simple definition, are custodians, custodians of policies and repository of institutional memory. The civil service that I knew and worked with embodied these ideals. Public service in Nigeria significantly lost its pride of place with the mass and premature retirement, uh, an unreasonable retirement of dedicated officers, particularly by the immediate, my immediate successors, uh, successors in office. And many of these brilliant uh, public servants, like late uh, uh, Pa Manua, Samuel Manua, many died virtually penniless, having lived lives of contentment and luxury at that time that their salary at that time could support. Many of their successors learned not to take what could then be considered as oath of poverty and consequently replace national interest with personal interest and greed. This naturally caused many to begin to owe allegiance to power or ethnic or religious blocks that tend to promote, to promote their self-serving interest. In turn, this promoted the growth of cronyism and deep-rooted corruption, if only to avoid being what that late, uh, well, I wouldn't call him crazy musician, uh, you know, fella. <laughs> you know, you know, called such. Uh, you know, he called uh, if only being called uh, original Sufferhead. I think those who remember him know in family exactly what that means. It meant the soldiers are crazy. <laughs> Sufferhead. Whilst the political restructuring of any nation 
is all well and good. It equally must be emphasized that without true reform of the Republic, uh, of the public service, such restructuring effort will almost um, always come uh, to note. I know a lot of the public servants that we have today, they are doing their best. They want to return to that sort of standard that is expected of them. And I wish them well, and I will encourage uh, you, the younger ones, uh, to imbibe those uh, ideas, uh, you know, for the sake, you know, of the nation uh, that you serve. In a restructured entity, leaders will need to walk, uh, walk with, and respect the civil service as an institution, else they should forget about spreading the proverbial dividend of democracy. I have deliberately used Nigeria to exemplify the issues of democracy in Africa because uh, over the years, the country has played the con uh, has played and continues to play a significant leadership role in a manner of speaking what is source for our goods is also source for other ganda in africa it is thus heartwarming that the organizers of this symposium have ensured that the two keynote speakers, uh, His Excellency uh, Mr. George uh, Opong Ware, uh, to the President of Liberia being represented, and Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese. Uh, eminently qualified to do justice to the topic uh, of whether democracy is making life better uh, in Africa today. One that is uh, the president by virtue of being on the hot seat now, and I remembered uh, him when he first went you know, to, uh, for this uh, attempt to be president. I think this was, I think, is it 2005, uh, the Honorable Minister? I was one of the, uh, and I know I had a lot of uh, contact with him, advised that they should, should have a, a peaceful uh, election and must respect uh, the uh, the result and uh, peacefully get along and if he makes it all well and good but if he fails let him try again and one day he will and today uh, he is the president uh, of Ghana <laughs> and if you remember he's one of those great uh, uh, African footballers in the United Kingdom and so he was king of the football. Now he is king of Liberia. Congratulations, <laughs> Mr. President. So by, so by virtue of having, except, well, you know, so I think he has had some experience now and so to say that democracy works. And now it is his turn to make sure that democracy works, that he looks after his people well. The thinking always must be the good, uh, you know, the, uh, the good of the people, the well-being of the people. And uh, that is always what any leader must always be thinking, uh, thinking about. And you must try and get in touch with the, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, with the people uh, get their views and see in what way you can, uh, you can be able uh, to resolve their problem. 
So having uh, one, so one having uh, being in the hot seat means really hard work. Now the other uh, is of course by virtue of having extensively studied the condition of citizens under various forms of government in Nigeria, uh, even as a young man and secretary of the Catholic uh, uh, Church in, in Nigeria at one time, as a very, very young, young man, yes, uh, you know, under all these various uh, uh, you know, government in Nigeria, vis-a-vis -vis his calling, you know, as a man of God, Father Kuka certainly uh, deserved his, his trip uh, to talk about uh, democracy, at least in Nigeria, and I know his contact that he also has uh, outside Nigeria. And then, of course, we have the panel of discussions, uh, you know, uh, eminent discussions, uh, they cannot, uh, they cannot be as any hotter. I think you can, uh, from the program, you can see the list of those uh, discussions. So the, it cannot be any hotter than as constituted, with vari uh, varying professional interest and experiences, as well. And I think uh, women are represented, isn't it, in the, in the team of the discussion. So at least there is respect for gender there as well, which is very, very important. And tell me, are youth represented? Are youth represented there? What age of youth? <laughs> <laughs> so, so with uh, all this, with varying professional interests and experiences, as well as gender orientation, uh, I think this will be a very in, uh, interesting discussion. So in the circumstance, then I will qualify to be considered as chairman student. Yes, because I'll be learning, even though I will not be able to participate in uh, giving the leadership, but at least I will participate in making sure that I cast my vote for whoever it is that is lucky to get the vote uh, to lead Nigeria tomorrow. So I qualify as a student willing to learn and modify my point of view in an age of enlightenment. Now, this is supposed to be a chairman short remark. Sorry if I've gone, I've gone a bit too far. So forgive me, uh, but I thought need to explain certain things uh, in order to give the, uh, the tone of this um, uh, meeting. So I believe my job as chairman is now done. And so let me rest, um, uh, let the rest of you, uh, especially the discussions, uh, will continue the work and uh, all of us will benefit from it. So thank you all for listening, and I wish us all a successful deliberation. Thank you. Please, let's continue with a round of applause for General Yakubu Gowan, former head of state of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, as he makes his way to his seat. And I think one thing that I very much, that stood out to me in his opening remarks was talking about having to step in as head of state, but also feeling it, that he knew that democracy was the way to go. And he said it emphatically that he does believe democracy, please be seated, ladies and gentlemen that he does believe democracy is making a difference. Now, I know this is a conversation that, in many aspects, many of us have had in our living rooms, we've listened to radio shows, we've listened to talk shows, we've had conversations on whether or not the dividends of democracy are making it down to the ordinary Nigerian on the street. 
and it will definitely be fascinating to hear what the panelists have to say about that. And I hope at the end of the day, we can agree that there has been progress in the system of government using democracy, not just for Nigeria, but other African countries, but we know that we can and have to do more. So as we continue to move things along, um, earlier I spoke about some of the programs and initiatives that the Center for Values and Leadership has spearheaded, and we'd like you to find out more about one of them. So a quick video about the leader without title. Please enjoy. Why do we have the leader without title tribute Colombia? The most important uh, thinking on leadership that affected me, that impacted me, uh, I was that offered by the Canadian Robin Sharma that focuses on the leader who had no title. It was particularly interesting for me because uh, our culture, our public culture in Nigeria, uh, is very, very much authority focused. The world is not getting moved forward so much by position as it is being moved forward by people who lead even when they don't have the title. And um, this series was designed essentially to use as an example some of those people to educate the general community on the one hand, but particularly our emphasis, the young, to educate the young of our country and to recognize that it's not about your title. The event today, wait for it, has categorically proved that the people who attain the age of 70 and above are not brain dead. of change in the environment, an organization is progressively becoming a dinosaur. You can see the same thing for an individual. Unless an individual is learning at a rate that is faster than the pace of change in the environment, that individual is becoming a dinosaur. So Leader Without Title is just one of the initiatives that the CVL has um, spearheaded, and we'll see one or two more, but it's an opportunity again to recognize those who continue to make a difference in their space. Yesterday, there was um, a story on social media, and it was about a gentleman in India whose son had died because of an accident at a pothole. And in the years following, he had single-handedly filled over 600 plus potholes in India. That is a man, one man. That's someone we could even say is a leader without title. So there is opportunity, there is space for each and every single one of us to do something and to make a difference. Leaders are not always the people who are recognized at the top and who have names and titles. Sometimes it's about leading your circle of influence, leading your family, leading your neighborhood, even leading in your organization. But none of us have an excuse not to do the right thing and to show others the way. So ladies and gentlemen, um, we still have a few more people we want to recognize who have joined us this morning. Please, a round of applause for the acting vice chancellor of the Ado State University, Professor E.O. Aluyor. Please, a round of applause for him. Thank you very much, sir. And there have been a few organizations that have partnered with the CVL in terms of making today's event possible. Um, so please, let's recognize them as again. Uh, Coca-Cola has also helped in making today's event possible. We also have representing Mutual Benefits Assurance PLC, Mr. Biyi Ashiru Mobalaji. He's the Executive Director of Operations. Please, a round of applause for him. Representing First Bank of Nigeria Holdings PLC, we have the Head of Risk Management, Mr. Idris Shitu. Please, a round of applause for him. 
And also, CVL receives support from General Electric International Operations, Nigeria Limited. We have Dr. Joyce Shingo Wige in the studio, in the auditorium with us. Please, a round of applause for her. If you heard me, you'll hear me say in the studio, and I'm so used to that because that's where my, my sphere of influence has been so for many years. So studio will come out, but I know this is an auditorium. Again, a round of applause for yourselves. We've started the program, and many more things are coming up. So a very big thank you to the sponsors and those who put this together, as well as many individuals as well who have helped the CVL and been a big support to the organization in this. We will keep things moving 